Here we are, I believe. Okay. okay, so I think it's time. Uh, welcome to the uh, second day of the of the conference. And uh, my pleasure, the first speaker today uh, is Elba Garcia Failde uh, from Université de Paris. Elba will tell us about generalized Kansevich graphs, R spin intersection numbers, and topological recursion. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, thank you also for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to, to speak here and also to see all these um, friendly faces and uh, even uh, just uh, familiar names. Um, so I will uh, speak about uh, generalized conservative graphs and their relation to our spin intersection numbers and topological recursion, uh, as Leonia said. And this is based on joint work with uh, Raphael Belliard, uh, Severin Charbonnier, and Bertrand Enard. And uh, you can find most of it in a recent archive preprint. So I will start. Uh, so, okay, these are the six parts of my talk. I guess the most important par part is uh, from two to five. So I will try to do the introduction very quickly because most of you are very familiar with these things. Um, and in the end, I will uh, talk a bit about the future but uh, two to five is the most important part of the talk. So I will start with topological recursion. I guess every, everyone uh, heard about uh, topological recursion here, but uh, since uh, nobody uh, really talked about it yesterday, I will uh, take two minutes to, to remember a little bit in case some people are new to it. So one important thing for everyone to remember is that um, I have this uh, professional deformation that I very often uh, abbreviate it to TR because I'm a bit uh, lazy. So you will see TR in the slide is always topological recursion. Um, so topological recursion was introduced uh, in the context of um, large uh, size expansions of random matrices um, around 2004 and uh, established as a universal theory independent of any matrix model um, a bit later by Chekhov and Arne Orantin. In general, our goal is to count surfaces of a certain genus and a certain number of boundaries. So we say of topology GN. And uh, this is in a sense that needs to be precise in, uh, needs to be made precise in every particular case. So uh, topological recursion associates to some uh, initial data that we call spectral curve, some differential forms, omega GN for every GN N. And uh, the spectral curve consists of a Riemann surface, uh, two meromorphic functions on it that we call X and uh, Y. And they give us a one form that is called omega zero one and very often has to do with the topology of the disks. And a one one form um, omega zero two that very often has to do with the topology of cylinders and uh, we sometimes call Bergman curve. Um, so the construction of the topological recursion is done um, via residue calculations on the Riemann surface. And it's uh, a recursion on the um, absolute value of the Euler characteristic of the surfaces of our initial problem, so of the SGN. So on the quantity 2G minus 2 plus N, that gives us a kind of complexity of the surfaces. So, okay, uh, this is the, the typical picture of the topological rec recursion for you to remember how the formula works. Uh, you can observe that the terms are in correspondence uh, with the ways of cutting a pair of pens from our surfaces SGN of the problem we are trying to solve. And we say it's universal because um, the same formula works in many different contexts. Um, today I will focus on uh, counting graphs embedded on surfaces and calculating volumes of moduli spaces and the relation of these two problems. Um, but yeah, but it's related to many other things that most of you know very well. Okay, so we uh, go now to the moduli space, of course. 
um, to every point of uh, MGN corresponds a curve of genus G with N marked points up to be allomorphism and with some extra structure in the modular space. So we also consider the delinear Mumford compactification of, of MGN. Um, so the typical one, just including nodal curves. Andrea Brini gave uh, an introduction that was uh, more general yesterday to this type of enumerative problems. Uh, but here we focus on the modular space of curves. Uh, so, okay, so to every point in the modular space corresponds a curve of genus G with N marked points. And if we consider the cotangent line to every point in every surface, uh, even if here it looks a bit like the, like the tangent, but okay, it's just to give an idea. Uh, we have a line bundle that we call Li for every marked point I. And since we have N marked points, we have N of these natural line bundles. And if we take the first turn class of uh, these line bundles, we get what we call um, Psi classes. And they are kind of the main actors of the, of the uh, cohomology of the moduli space of curves. So they are really fundamental pieces. Then if we consider the intersection numbers uh, of these cohomology classes that we just defined, that we also call correlators, uh, this, this name coming from physics. Um, yeah, we, we consider this, this type of numbers and we are interested in them because they contain uh, important information about the geometry of MGN. And in this particular case, they are zero unless the sum of the Ds um, is equal to the dimension of the moduli space, which is 3G minus 3 plus M. Okay, <clears throat> now I will state uh, quickly Witten's conjecture because uh, even uh, Paul Norbury uh, remembered it yesterday, I think. Uh, so if we consider the, the following generating series of intersection numbers of psi classes, Witten's conjecture tells us that this series satisfies the Cortevec de Vries hierarchy. And this is the, the first equation that is the classical KDV equation. And it also satisfies the string equation. Okay. Um, and well, two important things about this conjecture. One is uh, Witten's motivation, that is uh, an ac acute one. It's um, he he was inspired by, by the fact that two different models of two-dimensional quantum gravity should coincide. So on the one side, he considered uh, discretizations of surfaces by triangulations, and he used the, the, the physical idea, if you want, that if you send the number of vertices to infinity, this should be this should constitute a, a good uh, approximation of Riemann surfaces. And this is the idea behind it. And uh, I would say that topological recursion helped us build this kind of connections in, in many more contexts and in a more strong way. And this uh, work that I will talk about today is also about this type of things. Um, yeah, and another thing, uh, and an, an, another important thing of this conjecture is that it uniquely determines f. So it allows to compute all Witten Concevit intersection numbers that were difficult to compute just using um, algebraic geometry before. Now I just give you an explicit version of Witten's conjecture using uh, Virasoro constraints. So just because in the in the previous slide I cheated a bit and I didn't give the, the whole hierarchy. Um, so you can see the, the unexplicit version here that is equivalent to the original one. So we have all our Virasoro operators that are indexed by uh, integer numbers starting from minus one. They satisfy the, the Virasoro relations. And um, then it's very easy to, to state Witten's conjecture explicitly. It just tells us that for every integer uh, bigger or equal than minus one, the Virasoro constraints annihilate the partition function. Okay, so for the moment I stated Witten's conjecture that was formulated in the 90s, it predicts that intersection numbers of psi classes satisfy the integrable hierarchy of KD KDB. And just one year later, uh, Concevit um, defined uh, certain types of maps or graphs uh, that are actually a cellular, uh, a cell decomposition of the of a combinatorial model of the modular spaces. Then he related them to a matrix model. This matrix model is related to the integrable hierarchy. 
And on the other hand, he related them to intersection numbers. And like this, he produced a proof of Witten's conjecture just one year later. And well, nowadays, um, many time, uh, some, some time has uh, passed and we understand very well the relations, um, all the relations to topological recursion as well. For example, a topological recursion applied to what we call the airy curve uh, produces uh, intersection numbers in this uh, precise way that I, re that I remind, uh, reminded here. Okay, now um, we will talk a bit more generally about cohomological field theories, like very quickly, I will not uh, talk too much about them. Um, so we consider a vector space together with a non-degenerate uh, symmetric bilinear, bilinear form, uh, eta. And we say that a cohomological field theory that we abbreviate uh, as CoFT is a collection of uh, linear homomorphisms um, uh, of this uh, form over here, together with some uh, good behavior when the Riemann surface, uh, surface is degenerate. So this is what I called here plus some action, axioms that I don't give the details about. Um, you saw this if you were following the, the lectures on uh, integrability and uh, topological recursion, you saw a lot of details of this in uh, Danilo's mini course. So, okay, in general, we are interested uh, on, on uh, computing these uh, correlators that are just integrals over the modular space of these uh, cohomological uh, classes. Again, because they give us uh, important information about the geometry of MGN. And uh, I just, uh, here I recall the, the example of uh, the trivial QFT that is just uh, taking V equal to Q and um, all the classes are one. So we just uh, recover with and conserve its intersection numbers that, okay, now we understand well, but they are not trivial at all. So, okay, the, the QFT is trivial, but the numbers are, are not. And um, a less trivial um, cohomological field theory is uh, Witten's R-spin cohomological field theory. In this case, the vector space has dimension R, R minus one. Um, well, we take this uh, symmetric uh, linear form, just uh, very simple. And uh, we then constructed, or, or he gave some ideas uh, on, on why this uh, class should, should exist. And he constructed it for uh, genus zero, but for higher genus is uh, quite complicated to construct. This is the idea that I want to give for the moment. Ah, and I forgot to say that it's uh, of pure degree. Um, this, uh, this number over here, and these A's are what we call uh, the primary fields of the, of the CoFT. And they, they go from uh, zero to R minus one. Uh, R minus two, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, I said before that we understand well the relation um, of topological recursion with the other vertices of this graph, in particular, for the airy curve, they recover intersection numbers, but we know that this is a much more general feature. And uh, actually we have, uh, I stated here, this very, very useful result uh, by Enar and uh, later generalized by Dunen, Barkovsky, Orantan, Shadi, Spitz. That tells, us that tells us that there is a correspondence between topological recursion for spectral curves with simple ramification points and semi-simple cohomological field theories in general. This is a very useful result, um, but Witten's class is not semi-simple, so we cannot uh, study it directly using this theorem. So uh, yes, here uh, a bit later, Witten uh, formulated another conjecture, a generalization of the previous conjecture that tells us that intersection numbers of his class, this is a Witten's class, uh, with uh, psi classes, satisfy this time uh, the R KD KDB hierarchy. And uh, this was only proved uh, some years later by Faber, Sad, and Jonkin. Um, as I said before, so, so for uh, R equal to two, this recovers uh, conservative theorem. Nowadays, it has many proofs, and every proof gave uh, new information. 
um, some, uh, some emblematic ones after Konsevich are Mirzakhani using hyperbolic geometry, or Kunko Pandari Pande using, uh, using the ELSB formula. Um, but for uh, R bigger or equal than two, there is only uh, this uh, proof known. And I would say that the class is still uh, quite a bit under exploration because it's, uh, it's, it's a complicated class. So uh, what we ask ourselves is, can we complete this picture uh, for the general R, for, for a general R? In particular, can we um, generalize uh, the combinatorial side of a conservative proof? This is what I will uh, talk about in the rest of the talk. So I will start by defining uh, generalized conservative graphs. Uh, first of all, I will mix a bit the name uh, graph and map. This is because a map is basically a graph on a surface. I will uh, give the definition here precisely. Um, so yeah, I will mix a bit the two names, but I mean all the time uh, the, the same thing. I, I hope it's, it will be understandable. Uh, so a map of genus G is just an embedding of a graph into an oriented surface of genus G in such a way that the complement uh, of the graph in the surface is uh, homeomorphic to a disjoint union of disks uh, that we call the phases of the map. And we say that the map has n boundaries if uh, n of these uh, phases are marked in some way. Then it uh, depends on the model how we mark these phases. So here I give uh, just uh, an easy example. Uh, so this is a map uh, on a surface of genus one, and it has two phases that are marked just with these arrows here. So we, we say this map has topology one, two. Okay, here we consider two graphs, one embedded on the plane uh, that, uh, so, so it's embedded on the sphere. I drew it here, uh, drew it here on the plane. And uh, the other is uh, embedded on the torus, but the gray faces don't have the topology of the disk. So they are not really maps, but we can add some edges and then they, they, they are maps. So okay, this, is, this is just to, to uh, remember the definition of map uh, in the most uh, classical way, I would say, at least uh, for my background, but maps appear in many different contexts. And now we go really to define our particular model for this work. Uh, so I will define what I will call during the whole talk, generalized conservative graphs or generalized conservative maps. And uh, we consider four different sets, um, just because uh, we need them, you will see a bit why. Um, so I will give here the definition in, a, in an increasing way, let's say. So, okay, we consider uh, three types of vertices. So black vertices have this uh, restriction that they have degree between uh, three and R plus one. So for the whole uh, talk here, we will consider R to be an integer bigger or equal than two. Um, so, okay, black vertices have this restriction. Um, then uh, white vertices uh, don't have any restriction on the degrees a priori, but we want that there is maximum uh, one per boundary. And uh, yeah, then we have uh, square vertices that uh, don't have any restriction at all. So, okay, let me give some more details. So the first set is uh, called F. FGN, so uh, we, we fix the topology already here and the R. Um, so here, uh, the N mark faces are just marked because they carry some decorations with some special variables that we call Z, uh, Z1, Zn here. So here you see two boundaries uh, that are uh, carry these uh, uh, special um, weights, Zi and Zj. And then the internal faces that, uh, that we call just carry some weights in this set, but they don't have to be uh, different. Uh, we, we can even take a lambda one everywhere, for example. Uh, so, okay, here I put some, some lambdas in the rest of the faces. And that's it. Uh, this is the type of uh, maps that we count here in this set. They just carry black uh, vertices. So in the next set, we consider exactly the same, but we add cilia 
This is why this is the set that will be most more interesting for us and uh, will be called uh, the ciliated concept maps. So in here, uh, by cilia, I just mean um, I just mean um, uh, edges uh, carrying one uh, wide vertex that is univalent. And uh, yeah, remember that we have this this uh, restriction that there is maximum one wide vertex per boundary. So we cannot put, for example, another uh, cilium here. Um, yeah. White vertices have also another restriction that I will explain a bit later because it's a bit more complicated. And let's go to the next set. The next set is exactly the same. It's just that uh, in the first, so in the vertex that uh, um, from which the, the cilium uh, um, uh, is uh, emerging is uh, squared. And this tells us that uh, this vertex can have any degree because square vertices don't have any restriction. And this will be useful for us later. So this is kind of an auxiliary set, but a very important one. And another auxiliary set are what we call multi-ciliated maps. In this case, uh, the marked faces carry this uh, wide vertex, but they can have like a degree greater than one. And then uh, the decorations uh, that they carry are like Z i1. So for the i-th marked face is Z i1, Z i2, and like this. And these uh, are the sets uh, that I denoted here as. Okay, so now let me uh, tell you a little bit about the, um, so what is this restriction that I said uh, that we need to impose on the white vertices that I didn't mention so far. This is what we call the star constraint. So it is a bit easier to say, uh, to, to give an example of a map that doesn't have the, the star, doesn't satisfy the star constraint. So in, in, in it's this example here. So what do we mean? So we mean that if we remove the white vertex, the half edges that uh, remain, so we, we remove the white uh, vertex and also the half edges outgoing from it, uh, the, the half edges that uh, remain are attached to different phases. So this is not uh, uh, satisfying the star constraint. So star constraint, um, tells us that when we remove the white vertex, like in this uh, picture here, we should always get uh, half edges that are um, attached to one single uh, phase. Okay, so now we have uh, the maps that we are interested in, in counting, let's say, or um, it's more that uh, we will build some generating series for these objects because every time that you want to study families of objects is a good idea to put them to, to organize them into generating series. And then we want to, we are interested in calculating this generating series. So we first define the degree of, of a map. So the degree of a map is just uh, R plus one uh, times uh, the number of faces minus two plus two G. But of course you can also compute it using the vertices and the, the vertices and the edges. So the, this degree is important because if we fix the topology of a map and also the degree, so for example, this, uh, we fix this delta, which is the degree over R plus one, then the following sets are finite. So this allows us to, to count them. Then we define the potential of the model. This is just a polynomial. Uh, with uh, complex variables. In this case, uh, there, are, there are actually parameters, Vjs, and uh, it, it is of degree R plus one. So here is where the degree appears. And then we define, so remember that now we are defining the generating series of these uh, sets. So we want to define the weights um, per every element of these graphs that we defined. So, okay, we consider these A's, which are the decorations of the phases. So they belong either to the set of decorations for internal phases or to the set of decorations for boundaries. And we define the different weights. So the weight per edge, uh, so imagine we have a, an edge uh, bounding two phases decorated A1 and A2, that can be the same, but they can also be different. Then we define what we call the propagator, just like this. So using our potential, and uh, if they are the same, we just need to take the, the limit of this quantity and we just get one over uh, V prime prime. 
Then uh, the weight for black vertices um, is uh, of this shape over here that looks a bit complicated. So at this point, you may wonder like, why are you choosing these very weird uh, um, weights? And uh, fair enough. Um, you will see this a bit later in the talk. So, so now we are interested in two things. In one, how can we calculate this generating series? This way we will see now. And uh, later we will see why we chose these, um, these weights. Well, one first reason, if you want already, is that they have very nice properties. But you will see later why this is interesting to, why this is what we need to, to study intersection numbers. Okay, so black vertices have this restriction of uh, having degree between three and uh, R plus one, but this, you can also extend this definition to, to degree one and two. It's fine and actually it's useful. And white vertices just carry uh, weight one. Okay, so now we are ready to define our generating series. Uh, before that, we define the weight of a map. So the weight of a map is just the product of the weights of every element of our map. So for every edge of the map, we, we take the, the corresponding propagator. For every black vertex, we take the corresponding weight for black vertex. And for every square vertex, uh, this I didn't define in the previous slide, but it's just here, uh, you take this product. So these A's are the decorations around the vertex. And this uh, notation just means uh, faces around the vertex. Okay, so now we have our generating Elba, series. Elba, sorry, what is U? Can you, because A, yes. A yes. are indices of um, faces more or less, but what is U? Yes, good question. So U is kind of a weight uh, that is special for the square vertices. You will see later a bit which, which role it plays. So as you see, U only appears for square vertices and uh, you will have uh, this, this product for every square vertex. So but you have just one uh, U or you have... Uh, just one. Uh, and you for uh, any vertex no 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 so it's just just one so to speak number right it's just one and uh, this makes sense with the combinatorial model because remember maybe i was not very clear with this but remember that we can only have one square vertex so actually this product is a bit misleading because in the in the model that i defined we consider maps with only one square vertex so yeah, we will just have the, the product around the, of the faces around the vertex, and then we will have the same U appearing all the time. So okay. can, can I also ask, so the A's and Z's are not related to each other? Yes, the A's can be Z's. So the A's belong oh, either okay. to, the, to the lambdas or to the Z's. Oh, okay, so, so they can either be internal faces or boundaries. Okay, see, I, I missed this again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, the generating series is just the sum over this uh, set. So I'm defining it just for unciliated maps. Remember, F was the first set that I defined and it didn't have cilia, so that's why I say unciliated maps. Uh, we consider a fixed topology, and then we introduce a new uh, weight that takes uh, into account the degree of the map. So here, for example, uh, we just uh, fix this degree and we just sum over this finite set. So this is a well-defined uh, formal um, um, power series in alpha to the minus one, okay? And it's a polynomial in the other variables. Uh, yes, and uh, i belongs to one to n, so the z i's uh, correspond to the boundaries, the lambdas correspond to the internal faces, and we just have these uh, big n possibilities for the weights, and uh, that's it. And the, the vk's uh, are the coefficients of the potential, and there is where we had the, the r. So, okay, here I defined uh, with uh, details the generating series for f, and we do exactly the same for all the other sets. We just call the sets uh, the, the calligraphic letter and the, the straight letter is the generating series. 
Okay, so now let me give uh, an example um, of how this generating series works. And then uh, in the very end of the talk, with this example, we will be able to compute some intersection numbers. So, okay, we will do this example for topology 1, 1. And we do it in the case in which the internal, um, so the parameters for the internal phases uh, go to infinity. So in this case, uh, I can tell you that um, the uh, maps that have internal phases have a contribution that goes to zero. So this is equivalent to considering maps without internal phases. Okay, so we can forget about them. And then the degree, remember, was just R plus one times 2G minus two plus the number of phases. Since we don't have internal phases here, the number of phases is just the boundary, so it's just N. And since we, we are considering topology one, one, this 2G minus two plus N is just one. So in this case that we, we consider here, the degree is just R plus one. Okay, so uh, in this particular case, we just have these four graphs uh, in, the, in the ciliated uh, set. So let's uh, compute the generating series. Mm, you can see here that uh, I just put one propagator. So, okay, uh, one, one important thing that follows from here that uh, I already said actually, is that these maps have only one phase, right? The one, one boundary actually. So you will only see the, the weights Z1 here. So here we have the five propagators that correspond to the five edges here. So one, two, three, four, five, okay. Then we have the three three valent vertices, one, two, and three. So this is the weight that corresponds to this map. We do the same for this map here. We, we put the three propagators and the one uh, um, vertex of uh, degree five. And here we have two that have the same weight that correspond to these two here. You can uh, actually check the details. And then using this uh, identity here, that is something that would need to be proved. So this is just the, the mth derivative of the potential that I defined. So when you put variables that are the same in our uh, vertex weights, you just recover derivatives of the, of the kind of uh, previous weights. So when you put all of them to be the same, you just recover the mth derivative of the potential that corresponds to curly V1, actually. So, okay, uh, this is just to say that we have many of these uh, interesting um, combinatorial identities. And this is one reason why we choose these, uh, these weights, because we have all these uh, nice combinatorial identities. I just, okay. can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Um, uh, so in the first and the third graph where the cilium meets the, there's meant to be a black dot at the other end of that flag. At yes. The other end of that edge. Okay, just double checking. Yes, yeah. yes. Thanks. sorry. This is yeah. a bit uh, misleading in the picture. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, I was just saying that uh, using this identity, we just compute and we obtain uh, this, this um, quantity over here, this expression. Okay, later we will see how to get numbers out of this in some particular case. Now I just uh, give you some relations among the problems. So the first thing that we do actually is to relate combinatorially using bijective combinatorics, all these sets of graphs. Um, and we do this because we have in mind that we want to find the topological recursion for omega gn but it's not uh, so easy to do uh, in a straightforward way. So that's why we, we needed another auxiliar set, another auxiliar set. That's how we, we, we ended up with all these sets. Uh, so, okay, the relation between the unciliated and the ciliated ones uh, is just uh, taking these derivatives amounts to adding the ciliums. And these uh, two big things here, are just because the topology is zero one and zero two, as you know, uh, of are often uh, special. And here is the same. I just give the relation for uh, not for disks. So here we can relate uh, multi ciliated maps. Remember, this is uh, the multi ciliated with uh, ciliated maps. This is, this is done uh, by recursion, and we actually uh, reduce um, one by one. So there's many intermediate equalities here. 
so we just reduce uh, one by one the number of edges that go out of every wide vertex. And in the end, we managed to end up with just maps that have uh, um, degree one. Okay, so uh, we, we have these uh, complicated relations that are important. Um, and uh, finally, we can also, once we compute uh, U, so once we compute the, the um, ciliated maps with the square vertex, remember the U is uh, the weight per square vertex, uh, we can take this residue and we recover the, the W, so just the ciliated maps. Okay, so now we want to find uh, a touch recursion. You will see that we need uh, more than one set. In the touch recursion, it's not that we can just take our target uh, uh, type of graphs and find the touch recursion directly. So we produce a touch recursion that will help us uh, find topological recursion eventually. So the idea of touch recursion, as uh, many of you know, is to erase uh, one uh, edge and find some uh, um, bijections between uh, some set of graphs and some other sets of graphs that are simpler in some in some sense. So what is special about this is that we need to mix uh, many different types because they are a bit complicated. So what we do is we erase the first cilium from a graph belonging to you. And then we introduce a bivalent white vertex on the following edge around the square vertex in clockwise direction. And then we manage to find a recursion, uh, a latat, uh, for u and w. So, okay, we have uh, four different cases. Uh, I don't consider the case of the disk because it's a bit special, just to give you the, the idea in, in the generic case. So, uh, yeah, here we call uh, I this uh, set uh, Z2, Zn. And uh, the first case is the case in which, uh, okay, this is the, cilium, the first cilium that we are going to erase. And uh, we want to add this um, bivalent uh, wide vertex here. This is uh, what I explained here in the, in the idea. So we, the first case is the case in which the following edge is ad adjacent to a face decorated with a, with a lambda. So this uh, following case here is an internal face decorated with lambda j. So here, what we do is just we erase this so we have to compensate with the, with the propagator. Uh, we also erase uh, something around the vertex U. So we also have to compensate with this. And we add a new propagator. So we, we also need to compensate with this propagator. But it's, this is a very simple equality. Um, and now this equality is more complicated. This equality follows from one of the uh, one of the combinatorial identities that I gave in the previous theorem, but I will not uh, give the details. Uh, the idea is that uh, you can cut this and you can express this generating series in terms of the generating series of just ciliated. As I as I told you before, you can always reduce the degree of the white vertices and uh, end up with uniciliated. Okay. Uh, yes, and uh, these uh, relations are simple because we chose uh, the wide vertices to have um, to have uh, weight one, and also here you see that we need the square ciliated uh, maps because uh, we need to consider all the cases. So we want that this guy doesn't have any restriction on the degree because otherwise we raise this and we may end up with problems if it if it has the restriction of of a black vertex okay so here i just give the contribution and you don't need to follow all the details but it just follows from this picture the second case is the case in which the following edge is adjacent to a face that is ciliated uh, here with uh, with um, mark ZM. So the first thing we do is we unciliate, unciliate this phase. So this is with the relation that I showed in the previous theorem of just taking the derivative amounts to adding a cilium. So this is the first thing we use here. And then we, and then we end up in a case that is almost the same as the case before. Uh, so we just use the same relation that I explained before and we end up with this and this is the contribution. And then um, the next case is the case in which the following edge is adjacent to the first marked face. So we have the same marked face in both places. And this 
uh, case, as, uh, as uh, you know, because this is also typical for usual maps, um, has two possibilities. One is this one that I draw here, and the next one I will draw in the next slide. Uh, so, okay, here in the, the simplifications are very easy. We just compensate the way that we need to. We just cut and we find something that is ciliated and something that is square ciliated. So we need to consider this type of product that gives us these uh, typical quadratic terms of the topological recursion. And then uh, the other case that uh, also corresponds to having uh, the same face in both sides of the same et um, is this case in which the, these uh, two guys are connected. So we have uh, something with, with some uh, genus. And in this case, we get the typical uh, contribution that uh, reduces the genus and uh, increases the, the boundaries. Okay, so this is the, the that re, that's equation that I just uh, described um, with some uh, details in the previous slides. It just expresses a map in here as simpler maps. It's not a recursion in uh, in two uh, g in two g plus n as we want to because in the end we want to have topological recursion, so we want just a recursion on g and n. This one is a recursion on two g plus n plus d because here, for example, you get uh, the same topology as here. So now we need to do many more things uh, to to arrive to topological recursion, um, but uh, this is the starting point. So, okay, the first thing to get towards the, the spectral curve is we define this X and this Y that are somehow already the spectral curve, but we want to find a nice parameterization that allows us to, to get an explicit formula for, for disks, for uh, the Y. And this is what we do using this theorem that is a bit technical. So, okay, I just wanted to give a bit uh, the details because most of you are, are experts on, on topological recursion, but this is a bit uh, technical and uh, to understand properly, you need to do many examples because we are considering a, a very big family of uh, spectral curves. Uh, we have a lot of parameters and then the, you can uh, specify these parameters to certain uh, cases and then uh, things get a bit simpler. But the general thing is that uh, um, we can prove that there exists a polynomial of degree R um, such that we define this, uh, this uh, zeta uh, that will be the, the parameter of the topological recursion in this uh, implicit way. So we want these guys to be equal. Uh, we want this behavior to, to be satisfied. And then if this is true, we have that we can write this uh, y over here in the new variable, so we found that the new parameterization just in this closed formula, with this closed formula. And in here, you see this, uh, this uh, xi, um, they are just defined by this uh, relation here. And uh, one thing is that, that this important is that Q is a formal power series in, in alpha. This is very, very important because we are considering the, the combinatorial solution of the that equation. There are other solutions, but we are considering the combinatorial one that is a formal power series in alpha. And this actually plays a very important role to, to prove this theorem. Um, and uh, in the end, we get that this Q, so the Q that will give us the, the, the spectral curve is uh, uni uniquely determined by this, um, behavior over here that relates it to, to the V. Okay, we will see some uh, particular cases. So, okay, uh, the sketch of the proof of topological regression, because from here on it gets very, very technical, but again, I will give some little details uh, since um, many of you know uh, these things very well. So, so we start- so, 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 so the spectral curve is rational, right? And zeta is, this zeta is a parameter, is that right? Exactly, yes, okay. yes, yes. So you can, uh, there are different uh, ways to, to see this. You can try to prove that uh, it should have a genus zero and then find a rational parameterization of the curve that you know should exist. And this is uh, what we do here. You can also try to do it uh, combinatorially, like using that we really get the, the combinatorial solution. But yeah, this is important to get the, the explicit form of the, more or less explicit form of the spectral curve. 
so okay, we start with uh, the recursion a la tat that we found for u and w. Uh, yeah, this is a bit uh, special, right? Because it it includes two different things. Uh, this reminds a bit for people who know uh, who know this well. This reminds a bit uh, of the um, two matrix model in which you also get uh, kind of that recursion with uh, more than one thing. So it's it's a complicated model to, to solve. Uh, so, okay, the base topologies give us the spectral curve. I, I gave the main theorem in the previous uh, slide. And this is how it looks. So here, what I added, if you want, is just that omega zero one is this one. And uh, omega zero two is just the Bergman kernel as we as we imagine it should be because it's uh, geno zero. The third thing we do, and this is I would say the most uh, technical step, but I also think it's uh, it's uh, quite nice if you know if you know a bit uh, the theory of topological recursion, um, because we actually give from the that recursion a combinatorial interpretation of certain universal expressions that appear in topological recursion for curves that have higher rank. So, okay, you probably saw these expressions uh, before. If not, uh, never mind. It's, this is not uh, super important. Um, but uh, yeah, what you can uh, see here is that they are defined using these, uh, these uh, quantities over here. This is the type of quantities that appear in global topological recursion. That is uh, the one that allows um, higher order of uh, ramifications. Here, we don't want to allow higher order of ramifications yet. We want to have generic parameters. So we want simple ramifications, um, but we need to use all these quantities for, for K up to R because our curve has rank R. So, okay, it's a, it's a bit uh, intricate. Uh, so, okay, using these uh, quantities over here that contain uh, all the all the topologies, if you want, um, all the corresponding topologies uh, related in, in this way with this uh, genus defect that has to do with this uh, K. And this tilde is just, um, this is just uh, W and it has a small shift uh, for zero one and zero two as usual. Okay, so uh, we define this, uh, these expressions. They allow us to define the uh, H and P sets. So they are actually defined exactly the same. It's just that here we take all the pre-images of, of our uh, zeta one, and here we just take the pre all the pre-images except zeta one. Okay, so these two types of things are related in general for any topology. Actually, the relation that you get for zero one is the spectral curve, is the relation, uh, the polynomial relation between the x and the y. Uh, but they are related for any topology. And we actually find the combinatorial counterparts. So we define some other quantities that we didn't expect, but we define some other quantities that satisfy the same relation as this H and uh, P that are kind of universal. And uh, in the end, we managed to prove that they are the same. And this is how, in the end, we get the loop equations uh, that we need to prove the topological recursion. So I just gave a little example here, and uh, yeah, I will I will uh, skip uh, some details because uh, I'm uh, doing bad with time. Um, so just to give the example of uh, the combinatory interpretation of eight, so we just defined uh, related to u, uh, we take just the the positive powers of of u in uh, in this expression when you expand expand around u equal to infinity. Uh, this is how we define the combinatorial H, and then we manage to prove that this is equal to the H set. And the combinatorial interpretation of this H is just uh, it's just a generating series that counts the same graphs as, as uh, there are in, uh, in the set U, but they substitute, so, so you have to substitute the, the square vertex uh, that was marked with a U by, by a corner Around the around the black vertex, so you substitute the the square vertex by a black vertex, and uh, you add one uh, corner that was not there before, decorated with a U. So okay, the, this H uh, has also a combinatorial interpretation. We prove that is equal to the other one. We can also define a P that has a combinatorial interpretation. We prove is equal to this one, and it is like this that we can find the um, uh, loop equations actually. 
So, okay, apart from this, using touch recursion, we also get the analytic properties of the Ws. So we need the, 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 polar, the polar structure of all the Ws. And we prove this by recursion with the touch recursion. And then uh, using this uh, combinatorial interpretation of these expressions, we get the loop equations. Now really the, the typical ones, like uh, this is the linear one and this is the, the quadratic one. Uh, the quadratic one just tells us that a certain expression that in principle contains things that have some poles and ramification points of X. Um, this, this takes the right expression that kills all these poles. And uh, we know that once you have these two things, you are very close to, to topological recursion. This is actually what we do use, using uh, the spectral curve, uh, the analytic properties, and the loop equations. We just get topological recursion. And the, the, the definition of the differentials of the topological recursion is just this one. is is given by the ciliated maps, so the generating series of ciliated maps multiplied by the dx, uh, the, the dx as, uh, as usual. Okay, and until here, I said that we wanted, um, um, so it was important to take all the parameters to be generic. So our curves had simple ramifications, but for the application uh, on intersection theory, we actually want to consider um, uh, some degenerations of our families. Uh, in which some of these uh, R minus one simple branch points collapse into one single branch point uh, of order R, R minus one. And this is what we do, but actually this is the hardest part. And this part is much easier because luckily we can take this uh, family of spectral curves and we just take the limit epsilon goes to zero and we can apply the theorems of uh, Bouchard and Ar, uh, of uh, higher topological recursion, admitting higher ramification points. Um, so it just applies well in this case. We just get the higher topological recursion and we get that they, um, they um, behave well under the limit. Okay, so this is uh, a sketch of, uh, of uh, what we did in this uh, work. So we just uh, defined the generalized Konsevich maps. We proved they satisfy topological recursion. Uh, on the other hand, we related them to a matrix model. We related this matrix model to the uh, RKDV hierarchy. On the other hand, we used that this uh, arrow here is, uh, is established. Like that, we managed to relate intersection numbers to maps. And like that, we gave another proof that uh, R-spin intersection numbers satisfy topological recursion in a very combinatorial way. So we recovered this, uh, this theorem that appeared in, in different contexts already. So it's, this is not uh, a new theorem, um, but in this uh, work, we do it using the, the generalized maps that we hope in, in the end will uh, help us understand better the Witten's class. So, okay, let me, tell you a bit more uh, of details uh, about this, uh, although Leonia told me that I should uh, stop soon, probably. <laughs> so I will try to wrap it up quickly. So, okay, now you can see the, uh, you can see why we chose these uh, weights. This is because this uh, is a generalization of Konsevich models. So Konsevich graphs were Feynman graphs of this uh, Hermitian matrix model with external field. Uh, for Konsevich, he just took a uh, cubic potential. This just meant that uh, his graphs had uh, degree three. In our case, we just take a natural generalization of this model uh, to this uh, generalized uh, Konsevich matrix model uh, with this uh, potential uh, here. Uh, we call this the, the external field of the model. Then uh, you can rewrite this um, using this uh, change of variables to eliminate the, the linear term. And this uh, you need to believe me because uh, it takes a bit of computations to get here. Um, so, okay, you can eliminate the linear term then to be able to use uh, Wick's theorem. And uh, you can rewrite it like this. And here you can see that uh, uh, precisely, uh, you can see appearing the propagator and the weights that we defined in our combinatorial model. So we, we took the inspiration from the matrix model. Okay, you can use a weak theorem to relate uh, the partition function to the graphs, actually the free energy to, to the graphs. 
And if you take certain correlation functions, they correspond to ciliated maps. So here you take these uh, cumulants with these uh, diagonal uh, factors here. And this you can see as these derivatives with respect to the, to the external field. And you can relate it to the topological expansion of the, of the ciliated maps. And one uh, nice uh, feature that we also didn't expect, but uh, yeah, actually it was, it was there from the beginning. So, okay, <laughs> we could have uh, realized uh, before. Uh, one nice feature is that there was another model. Uh, I mean, the, the matrix model with external field was already um, studied uh, from a topological regression point of view, but it was proved for other correlators. Uh, so it was proved for these uh, generalized uh, resolvents, uh, these uh, typical ones with the, with the traces, that they satisfy topological recursion. In this case, for y x, where y and where x y is the spectral curve for our model. So okay, you can uh, see why this is interesting because this has to do with uh, symplectic invariance. I will comment this a bit um, in the future work. Yeah, here I just wanted to give uh, an idea of the definition of uh, Witten's class. I can say very quickly that uh, Witten, so here I just uh, reminded what I said before. I can say uh, quickly that Witten defined it for genus zero, as I said before, using um, R spin structures. So the moduli space of R spin structures just covers uh, MG and bar, and it parameterizes the Rth roots of this canonical bundle twisted or possibly twisted at the n mark points with multiplicities given by the primary fields. So, okay, this is uh, just an idea. And then we then uh, defined the class for genus zero using these uh, R spin structures. And uh, he just uh, defined it as the push forward to M0n of the top uh, Witten class or uh, the Euler class of the dual of this bundle over here that has a fiber given by H1. And this is possible for a uh, genus zero just because in this case, we know that the, the zeroth cohomology is zero and uh, hence uh, U has constant dimension and we can define this vector bundle. In general, this is not true. So even for, uh, for uh, genus one, uh, the existence uh, of this class is non-trivial and uh, the construction is complicated. It was, it was done by Polish Chuk and Vaintrop and, and in 2004, later simplified in 2006 by Kyodo and uh, later some uh, analytic uh, constructions appeared. Okay, so now uh, I let me briefly uh, sketch uh, the relation uh, of maps of our maps to R spin intersection numbers. So here I just remind the definition of intersection numbers with this uh, convenient uh, Witten's notation. So we just get using uh, strongly this uh, result uh, of uh, Aleva Morbeke that uh, the partition function of the uh, generalized Konsevich model provides the only solution of the uh, RKDV hierarchy that also satisfies the string equation. So, okay, here we go from the matrix model to the, to the hierarchy. Then we use faber sandin Drunkin to get the relation between the intersection numbers and the hierarchy. And finally, using these two relations and using that our graphs are related to the matrix model, we can make the connection between the graphs and the intersection numbers. And uh, well, it's this uh, formula that looks uh, really ugly actually, but uh, it allows you to, to compute, for example, it allows you to, if you want to compute uh, cer certain types of graphs, you can compute the numbers or even the other way around because it's not clear in this case that it really help, helps computing. Um, but uh, hopefully it can help a bit understanding the, the structure of the problem and uh, yeah, dreaming a bit maybe also of the class. Uh, so we could see this as a, some kind of ELSV formula because it relates a, a problem from combinatorics to a problem from uh, uh, intersection theory over, over MGN. And here I just finished the example that I started before. So I computed for topology 1, 1, I computed the generating series of ciliated maps. This is just the result that I got before. 
Then in this particular case, uh, which is the case that, uh, that has to do with intersection numbers, we just get uh, this uh, simplified formula. Uh, very easily, we just uh, get uh, the omega 1, 1 from topological recursion. And then here, we just use our ELSV type formula to relate the graphs, the information coming from the graphs to the information coming from uh, intersection theory. And like this, we are able, for example, to recover all uh, one point intersection numbers in topology one one for any R. So this is just a little example of how we can use uh, our result. And now uh, let me wrap up what we did and uh, a bit of uh, future work in the last uh, minute that I have. Um, so, uh, okay, so far we just, uh, you can find everything we did in this uh, recent, uh, preprint that uh, where we established all these arrows that I explained before. Uh, some work in prog progress has to do with uh, finding uh, or, or better exploring consequences of our work in algebraic geometry. Uh, one of them is to use the power of topological recursion to study the intersection of Witten's class when we vary the spectral curve and then use uh, an R those correspondence when we get, when we deform to something that is uh, semi-simple. The other is to try to use uh, everything that we have that is very explicit to, to find, uh, to, to better understand the symplectic invariants. And finally, to apply to combinatorics to, to solve the conjecture that tells us that if you exchange the X and Y for the one Hermitian matrix model, then you count uh, fully simple maps. That is a conjecture together with uh, Guy Tambogo. And then uh, some uh, more uh, dreamy things is, uh, can we establish directly this uh, relation? This, uh, this would be very nice. And um, yeah, can we understand symplectic invariance in general? Can we also apply this to simple maps? Well, yeah. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Elba, thank you for, uh, so let's thank Elba for a very nice talk. Uh, yeah, sorry, Leonie, I didn't manage to. No, no, to okay, you. but uh, a couple of short questions, please. <laughs> well, Hi, Elba, um, can you say a little bit more about where you said um, that you take the limit of the spectral curve that you get? Yes. Um, in some slides ago, I guess. So do you actually get a get a topological recursion for the deformed curve? And then you take the limit to get the recursion on the curve that's the, the R area curve? Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. In this case, it's, it's very easy because it's this uh, one parameter family and everything behaves nicely. So I, I know that, uh, that you and uh, together with uh, Gaetan and uh, Vincent and some other people are studying uh, like different um, instances in, in which uh, maybe this uh, limit doesn't work uh, so well. <laughs> but uh, luckily in this case, everything from the original paper of uh, Bouchard and R applied, uh, we, we checked uh, everything carefully. So we just uh, used their, their result in here. So, I mean, somehow their argument is that you reduce to like, you reduce from the global regression to the local regression. Right, and then, or you go from the local regression to the global regression, and then you take the limit in which the branch points all collide. Yes, exactly. But I, okay, I mean, maybe we could talk about it later also, but I think there's some issues already with that argument. Um, oh, okay, okay, yeah. we can, uh, we can yeah. talk about it. In principle, I, uh, some of us discussed uh, a bit with uh, Gaetan and maybe also with uh, Van Sein. In principle, everything was working in this instance. So yeah, I, I hope that's that's fine. But maybe yeah, maybe we can discuss uh, how things uh, should be written. Okay. <laughs> how yeah. some details should be written. Yeah, thanks. Okay, <clears throat> more questions. Well, if well, uh, we have of course we uh, we have many questions, but uh, unfortunately we have to postpone it. So let's again say Salba. And, uh, and we are going to the next talk. Okay. Right? But 